Welcome back to the Iron Sights Podcast. I am here with the uh, one and only John Norris. John, welcome to the show. Scott, thanks for having me, man. It's good to be here. I could not be more excited for today. Uh, I'd be lying if I said I hadn't been anticipating and maybe didn't sleep <laughs> as much as I should have last night. And you about involved. today. There's so much to cover with you. You've had a prolific career, uh, both in the California uh, Department of Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife, sorry. And uh, that- Yeah, the new name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're still, we still think Fish and Game though, right? Yeah. We still got that whole old school nostalgia. Well, I remember that's what it was when I was out fishing and my yeah. fishing tags would get, ta- would, would get checked. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That's where, I, that's where I, I go to. But then also the war on drugs here in the state, particularly the state of California, but also your influence just in general. Sure against the cartels and some of the things that they're doing on our wild lands here in the United States. But again, particularly here in California and to get more specific, one of the things that's so intriguing to me is that so much of uh, the, in the books that you've written, the documentaries that have been done. I mean, you're a, you're a multi-time author. You, you've been on multiple uh, documentaries, podcasts, uh, TV shows, the thin green line. We can talk about that. We can talk about, um, uh, all the stuff that you've done on the History Channel, uh, some a lot of stuff happened literally in our backyard, like just yeah, miles crazy. from here. Yeah. And I got to give you a shout out, man. This is the first time I've been to your studio right here in downtown San Jose, which as you know, is where we both grew up, you yep. and I both. And here we are back in my old stomping grounds and a uh, great studio, great area. And literally where we're sitting, Scott, as you know, from reading the books and doing a little bit of research, 360 degree circle around us, any of these foothills were at one time loaded with, you know, Mexican cartel, toxically tainted cannabis going all over the black market, all over the country and poisoning anybody that was ingesting it at the same time, you know, threatening our public and polluting our water. I mean, in the Silicon Valley foothills, which is surreal for anybody to think of that. Mm -hmm. And it's still kind of crazy after all these years of doing it myself, but really kind of everything that was that big career turn that we talked about before going on air and, and recording was what happened here, you know, in the Silicon Valley foothills as a template to what's going on in the rest of the country. Well, I think there's, there's a way for us to lead into this. Let's do, let's talk a little bit about how we got there for you because you're always an outdoorsman, right? right? And there was, this was to me, the, the evolution is very interesting and I know there's a lot to it, but maybe you could kind of take us back to how you got into this line of work and, and where you are now with it. And then we can kind of get into some of the things you just mentioned. Sure. Yeah. Well, like you said, I, I was born and raised here and came from a family of conservationists, mom, dad, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, hunted, fished, hiked, just loved the outdoors. Um, and a lot of them were in California. I mean, my dad and mom were here, you know, I was, I'm the oldest of four. So as soon as we could walk and talk and <laughs> anything else and actually be mobile, we were in the woods. Right. And at nine years old, I was, you know, getting my hunter safety certificate. Dad was helping me pass the test. I could barely hold up that single shot 20 gauge <laughs> to hunt that first duck. But yeah, I was, a, I was a pup um, kind of following in dad's footsteps. So wildlife, waterways and wild lands have always been kind of my sanctuary. Um, we have a saying in, in the family, my dad always said, the woods are my church. That's where he found peace. That's where he found strength. Um, and we did too. You know, that's just the bottom line. And, and what people don't realize is here where you and I are sitting in, in our mutual hometown is you just get out of the Silicon Valley, the tech capital of the urbanization of San Jose, where we sit at ground zero right now and go, you know, five to 10 air miles in any direction. And there's a ton of wildlife here. You're out there too. Yeah, You're, you're out be, there. Yeah. You can get in really remote canyons. Um, there's big game, there's small game. There's, you know, migratory steelhead trout that are threatened and endangered fisheries, warm water fisheries. There's a plethora of wildlife here. So even though I'm not a resident of California anymore, I still spend a lot of time here because of the topics we're talking about and still indirectly protecting our environmental resources in California because it'll always be home. You know, it started here. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting thing. So for people thinking Silicon Valley you know, or the Bay Area, South Bay Area here in San Jose, San mm -hmm. Francisco, only about 50 miles above us up the peninsula. And then you're, you know, you've got Oakland that's about that that far over on yeah. the East, East Bay and all the things, the big tech that happens and the industry that happens. What you just said there about going five to 10 air miles in any direction, you're in wildlands. Right. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to kind of realize for people in that the way the terrain and the geography works here, we're in this like bowl, we're in this valley. And as you punch out, there really isn't much of an even, sorry, there isn't much really of a gradual 
uh, take as you get out into right. these areas. You're either straight in the Pacific yeah. Ocean, right? Or you're, you know, in some, depending on where you are, obviously, or you're going straight up, up yeah. to 3,000 feet or so, and then you drop that far yeah. back down the other side and it just keeps doing that all the way to the ocean. So it makes it very remote and it can leave you very exposed. So anyhow, going back to the being, being an outdoorsman, um, you, 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 you you were always doing that as a, the woods or your church, you know, yeah. kind of mantra and getting out there and doing stuff. How, how did the, the career path take shape for you? Well, it, it was kind of an end around, you know, I found it luckily by mistake cause I was gonna, I was going into engineering to follow my uncle's footsteps and was uh, at San Jose state at an engineering program for civil mm. hydro dams, that kind of thing, working in the outdoors. And then I was kind of realizing this is really cool. It's going to be a very lucrative career, but I'm going to be developing wildlands and being an engineer for that. And that has to happen. I get it, but it wasn't really inspiring me because where was I going when I wasn't in engineering school or knocking out, you know, classes right. and finals at San Jose State? I was in the woods. It's the woods, yeah. So Scott, it was one of those deals where I was on the fence of going into special forces through an ROTC program while I was in the engineering program. And then I met a game warden in the backcountry my first year uh, at San Jose State. And that changed my life. I've been as, you know, long story short, He's checking me on a winter hike with my my brother outlaw on a pack horse, and we're way in the back country. Storms everywhere. No one's in Henry Coast State Park, right? Which is a massively beautiful park, our second largest, you know, in the state, and just not far in the foothills to the uh, east of us here. And I, I bent his ear for about two hours. This game warden that was checking us, and my eyes just you know lit up. And my my brother outlaw looked at me and said, "Uh oh, yeah, what just happened?" He's I done. said. I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah, gone. Yeah. I changed. I literally came and talked to an advisor for criminal justice as soon as I got out of that the woods in that trip. And, um, you know, about five years later, when there was a window and I was in grad school at San Jose State killing time and working as a probation counselor right here in Santa Clara County at the Justice Center, I got into the academy in 1992 and never looked back. And eventually started in Southern California for three years mm -hmm. down in Riverside County, kind of the Inland Empire, the Lake Elsinore, Temecula, okay. working over in Orange County, sometimes in LA. And it was, I mean, it was the wild west down there. It got really Western quick with gangbangers coming from LA and then spotlighting animals with like, you know, AK-47s mm -hmm. and gillnet and fish doing crazy things. But the learning curve for a new game warden was exponential. I learned so much more down there in three years um, from an officer safety standpoint, from doing hard arrests, you know, felons that you're taking into custody that have, you know, no bail warrants. I mean, pretty crazy criminals from the poaching standpoint is a brand new cadet just out of the FTO and a new officer. So after three years of doing that, I got the opportunity to come back to the Gilroy position, which was home base and I couldn't pass it up. Right. And that's kind of where I based the rest of my career. Even when we later on jumping ahead, developed the special operations unit, the marijuana enforcement team. And I, we just ran it, you know, I basically did my supervisory leadership role in that team from here as well. We were based out of the Silicon Valley for a center. So um, yeah. And just worked here moving forward. To the, till I pull the plug. So tell me about, I mean, you just mentioned some of the hard arrest type stuff that you're doing in Southern California. Talk about the life of a game warden uh, as it compares to other types of law enforcement. And when I, when I, when I talk about law enforcement too, and I think we want to leave out like park rangers, state and state and federal rangers that are law enforcement. Right. Uh, in, in a lot of cases, not in every case. Um, but maybe you could talk about that. Like what's, what's the day-to-day -day look like? What does life look like out there? Yeah. You know, you got to think of, being kind of solitary. You know, one thing game wardens have to do is they have to be self-starters. They have to be really comfortable working alone without supervision because we don't have backup. We seldomly get to ride with another partner because we're so spread out. Um, for instance, I was one game warden of seven in a squad that covered two and a half counties. So you can imagine how big our territories were. Massive. And in the Bay Area, you're lucky if you have five out of those seven or four out of those seven because there's always vacancies because people are leaving high cost of living Bay area mm -hmm. to go to the garden mountain spots where they can afford to start a family, own a home. So we were always understaffed with already an overwhelming task of had we had every position full. Um, so get used to working alone. You know, you have an awesome canine I've got to meet today. You got mm -hmm. a pup here in the studio and I had my yellow lab and that was about it. And eventually, you know, when you have a good partner that you can do details with and the more dangerous operations, you will double up. But game wardens have to work alone. We have to get ourselves out of situations that can get hairy, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, mental, verbal, as opposed to all the tools on the bat belt. Right. Right. Um, 
that's something a game warden has to be a master at. And I think we all get really good at it to be effective and being able to communicate with people, de-escalate situations. Uh, and definitely something that became my forte in the agency was defensive tactics, firearms, hand to hand, uh, you know, just officer survival tactics and, and being the best cops we could at that. Because if it did get that deadly and we had no other options to survive and escape that situation, we kind of had to do it with limited resources and back up 30 to 30 minutes to three hours away, maybe even further. So that's kind of the difference. Um, and you look at game wardens in other states and they're even more depleted than we are here in California. Uh, I co-host two podcasts, the Warden's Watch and the Thin Green Line mm -hmm. with uh, retired Lieutenant Wayne Saunders, and he's in New Hampshire. And I think they have like 50 game wardens. For the entire state. For the whole state. Yeah. And Scott, it's crazy because they have moose, they have, you know, all these <laughs> massive big game animals like they have right. up in Montana. They have uh, search and rescue. They got mountain climbers going missing on like mini Mount Everest, you know, they got massive peaks in that state. I had no idea. And there's no... They have hardly any guys. Yeah, there's nothing. Yeah. So, it, you know, we all have that plight every state we're in um, on the game warden front. But, you know, we, we, we call ourselves, we're part of the thin green line, right? And I know you've heard that term and um, Joe Rogan coined that term to be public, not just for game wardens that we're all part of the thin green line. You're an instrumental part of it. I'm grateful to you for having this conversation because to protect the environmental resources we have that are left in this great nation, and especially, you know, in the golden state here, which is still near and dear to me and you as well, mm -hmm. um, it takes everybody. You know, a game warden isn't going to put a dent in commercial poaching or water pollution unless we have informants, we have eyes and ears out there, people calling the Caltip line, or just people having awareness to, to keep problems out of a particular area that they may not know about. Yeah, I think that's the... so. You, exposure, you're out mm -hmm. there, uh, your situational awareness has to be top notch. Right. I've, can you maybe talk and give people just a, some insight as to some of the, the, the things that you would run into on a regular basis? I mean, I just sort of jokingly, but at the same time, very, I, this happens and it's happened to me and I'm glad to, to have it happen. And that is like, you're checking a fishing license, yep. you're checking tags for, for hunting yep. licenses, and you're checking equipment, making sure people are using, not using something they're not supposed to be right. using, things like that. What are some of the other things? Because as we, as we start to escalate this, you said, you talked about some of the things you were doing in Southern California and things in the Bay area got, they, they escalate here. Sure. And we're going to, I want to talk about that. But what are some of the other things that people might not know that the game wardens deal with on a regular basis? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and we got to remember that a game warden specialty is wildlife protection, enforcing environmental crime laws. Uh, that's our forte. That's our focus. That's our mandate. But we're sworn and trained under the post, you know, uh, peace officer standard and training mm -hmm. and certification after we get out of our academy to do anything that law enforcement would do. CHP, state police, city police, the sheriffs, basically we are authorized to do any type of victim crime, uh, drug crimes, whatever the case, uh, you know, sexual assault crimes we might run across, but we focus on the wildlife stuff. Uh, converse, you know, kind of, kind of oxymoronic to that is even though it's not our forte to do mainline law enforcement, public safety stuff, when we're deep in the woods, where do felons go when they don't want to get contacted? Where they want to be hidden. Where does somebody take somebody to do a drug deal or to do a sexual assault or let's say a rape? They're going to go off the beaten path and go up Croy Canyon Road, let's say, or they're going to get up, you know, on the back end of Mount Hamilton, or they're going to find in this area, anywhere that's slightly remote in our state county parks or maybe behind a lock gate. So we run across a lot of that. And the hunting and fishing checks are a very small part of what we do, but those are the, the most enjoyable because 95% of everybody that's got a gun out there, just like you and I, they're, they're law allies. abiding citizens, they're right? law abiding citizens They're teaching yeah. their kids to hunt. They're, 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 you know, promoting a great ethic and conservation to protect wildlife through ethical and responsible consumption right. under that whole conservation model. And, and I just, I, that's what I love about what conservation is about is we get allies and people that are happy to see us. It's not like, Oh, he's got a gun. He's a right. felon. And, and I'm San Jose PD and am I going to get in a gunfight? Is my, you know, my uniform cam on? Is this being documented properly? How am I going to take this gang guy down or whatever? Um, so that's, that's the difference. But we run across a lot of guns and most 95 plus percent of the time, those are allies and they're going to be fine. But then there's going to be that, you know, under 5% where it is a felon on the run. It's a guy with a no bail warrant. Maybe he's been a sexual predator across the entire U.S. and he just happened to end up in, Uvis Canyon Park or Mount Madonna right. Park. And I'm just in my hometown where I grew up 
I'm cruising over, I'm checking the creek to see if there's anybody, you know, fishing for steelhead in Bodfish Creek right there below Mount Madonna, mm -hmm. illegally out of season, knowing they're going to migrate and spawn and we got to protect those fish. And now I'm into a rape in progress. So I've got a guy that who knows, he could have been a serial murderer. You know, he could have multiple different, you know, very dangerous crimes and be a real threat to anybody he runs across. And he just happens to be out there poking around in the creek or maybe he's soaking a rod illegally and we run into that and we're alone and we're far from the truck and we're on foot. So all those different elements happen and they've happened to me hundreds of times and every game warden, you know, that you're going to talk to has had their share of getting in those situations. And sometimes they get kind of Western and get crazy. And, you know, nine times out of 10, if we're lucky and we read the situation, right. Um, we get out of there without, you know, unscathed for everybody involved. Yeah. When you just kind of compare and contrast against, you know, law enforcement on the streets of San Jose, it would be like pulling a, a traffic stop, a regular yeah. traffic stop and pulling somebody over and any number of things can happen. And we know most of the bad things that happen, happen on typical traffic stops or on the domestic violence type calls or whatever. Right. But, but so you got to be ready for everything. When did you recognize, I mean, how many times did that, did it have to get crazy? The wild, wild west, or how many, when did you recognize that this, the drug cartels and the grows and the things were a problem that needed to be faced in a different type of way. Yeah. It, it, it was going on a lot longer, you know, way before I was made aware of it or my colleagues were, um, I know I ran across growers leaving the forest that looked like we assumed they were poaching animals and behind log gates. And now they're on foot, say behind Mount Hamilton and they were coming straight out of cartel grows. And, and this is, you know, um, early 2000s, late 90s when I was back here at home. But in 2004, and I go into the, in, in the first book, War in the Woods, in the first chapter, I go into how I was immersed in a massive cartel grow um, through an informant. And that informant happened to be a guy I grew up with, fisheries biologist, really outdoor savvy, call sign GI in the book for a code name. And he's doing a master's thesis on threatened and endangered fish and frogs um, right below Co Park. Palisoo Ridge. It's now open space authority property, the old Palisoo Ranch. And he had been studying these creeks, Scott, for several years. And it's like April and one of them is bone dry. And there's a bunch of plastic and bisqueen and, and, you know, little, uh, pieces of debris all the way down this dry Creek. And he calls me alarmed and goes, someone's got to be diverting the water up top, John, okay. because the, the, you know, the, the steel had just migrated, all those fish are dead. There's not a living frog. This, this creek is dry and it shouldn't be. Whereas the other tributary is fine. And that was one of those things where back in the day, you take an informant like that, that's savvy. You throw him in the truck. You use him as a bird dog. You combine forces. We go check things out. And we did. We drove up the mountain. We dove into a canyon. No cell coverage. No phone coverage. And here are me and GIR going straight down a mountain. And we get into the most pristine canyon that looked like a little mini Grand Canyon side tributary. And beautiful. And we find the water source and we find the pipe in it and we find the visqueen plastic and we find the diversion, which at the time I didn't know that was the main MO, the main method that these cartels use to divert a good, you know, pristine water waterway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we followed the water line down and it led to, you know, 20 inch, two foot immature marijuana plants. And then we could see an encampment and now all of a sudden we're seeing growers and they've got AK 47s and they've got machetes and they're showing situational awareness as they're tending their grow silently. And they have and no, here, and here you are, yeah. what a sidearm and a civilian. I've got my sidearm, yeah. I've got an AR and I've got an unarmed civilian. Yeah. yeah. And I've got no radio coverage, no cell coverage. And here we are literally in my backyard where I grew up. And these guys do not look like the people you would expect to see in our woods public, private park or anything. It was like, you know, we are not in Kansas anymore, Toto. This is crazy. So we fortunately didn't get detected that day. We stayed hidden. We let them move out. We busted tail and got up that mountain as fast as we could without mm -hmm. tapping out. And, you know, my mind is spinning now. I got to get a hold of some agency guys, whoever works this type of stuff. And that's when I was immersed in meeting guys from Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, the marijuana eradication team guys that would later become, you know, brothers and sister partners. And we'd form an alliance and just, you know, everything that led to our, our agency team much later was largely because of the relationship we built with Santa Clara Sheriff's Office. Um, and when, when I saw that grow, it just blew my mind because I had never seen so many impacts to such a sensitive Creek. It's so hidden. Nobody ever finds it. You know, it's one thing if like a tech company comes in and develops against the Guadalupe river illegally, and they push a bunch of silt in it and a bunch of endangered species are threatened. You can't hide that. 
that's going to be a high profile case. We're going to, you know, involve other agencies. Right. And I worked a ton of those on the environmental crime kind of urbanization in Santa Clara County. The uh, stream alteration violations were off the hook all the time in this county. But when you get something insidious like that, brother, that's so far up in the back country that no one's ever going to see it. And they're not going to really maybe see the damage it's causing downstream. downstream. And then understanding, and we had no idea at the time, because this was the first exposure, but we didn't know they were using the EPA banned poisons, right. the toxic carbofuran, the metafos, all these different Qfuran, all these trade names of an insecticide that's so deadly, the EPA banned it from use in America 20 years ago. Because even when you take a 12, you know, like a 12 ounce bottle of like crystalline powder of carbofuran, it's, it's, it's a very potent insecticide. It's made to keep everything off the plant for agriculture. Mm -hmm. And it's made to be diluted with five, 6,000 gallons of water. And these cartel guys are putting them in three to five gallon backpack sprayers and they're spraying this stuff unprotected. Everywhere. And it's on the plants, it's on the flour that's going to the black market for consumers, whether they're kids, medicinal users on the East Coast, Midwest, wherever, other parts of California. Um, and it's getting into the water and it's in the soil. And what people don't realize, a couple of tablespoons of that stuff just in a small creek can kill two to five miles of everything living in Wildlife. that creek. Mm -hmm. That's how nasty this stuff is. I mean, one of the active ingredients is a nerve agent that the Nazis developed for their bioweapons program way back in World War II. So EPA said, no way, but that's America. It's felony to use it and possess it here. Bad guys don't care about Bad that. Bad guys don't care, right, brother? And they can get it in Mexico and Tijuana. Um, the African poachers, which is, and this is so sinister as well, but it kind of goes hand in hand with the greed and anything for profit at the expense of pristine wildlife. Elephant and rhino poachers in Africa, right? You hear those stories of the Kenya Rangers getting in gunfights and it's a full battleground to stop these, these rhino uh, poachers of killing off rhinos and, and elephants and any ivory, ivory type animals. But they're now using that in water sources so they can poison, you know, a ton and a half, two ton rhino and never fire a shot. Never know, yeah. And be detected. So... The rhino poachers are using the same tactic the cartels are using because that stuff's out in the third world market. And that's starting to become a big awareness, kind of a hot button issue that environmentalists are starting to look at as I start to talk to other countries on the negative effects of these poisons and how we've seen it firsthand on the cartel front. It's disgusting. I, it, it maddens me. It unnerves me to think about right? you know, the, uh, just the, the not caring, again, Criminals and bad guys don't don't care. They only care about profit. I bet you're 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 talking about one spot where three to five miles downstream, you've now mm -hmm. wrecked everything. What's the reality about of these types of things that are happening just in the state of California? I mean, how many estimated illegal grows are happening around this time that you're figuring all this out? Five, six thousand, maybe, maybe more. You know, I would say that was conservative. And this was back in 04. And we, we want to kind of give a history lesson a little bit. And there's been such a changing dynamic in cartel trends, right. especially since regulation. Prop 64 mm -hmm. changed the game. And it didn't change it for the better. It just shifted focus of where the cartels went. And I'll get into kind of okay. all that so it makes sense. And we do cover that. You know, in the second edition that's about to drop January 16th, just so everybody knows, is the second trade paperback, the second version of Hidden War Drops, because we have about 50 copies left of the first edition hardcover that you have. And one thing I did in the new introduction is update on, well, what's happened since the first book was published four years ago, right, right. when I retired. And it's been an over, it's just been crazy. Um, we want to look at Prop 64, we're now five years in, mm -hmm. of regulated cannabis in California. Voters were sold a bill of goods that basically said, hey, this is going to stop the black market. This is going to put a bunch of money into edu cannabis education for kids. It's going to fund agencies, which it did. Uh, granted, we are getting a lot of money. My old teammates are getting funds now from some taxation for equipment and overtime. But the, the, the worst thing that it did, though, that kind of negates all those benefits is it incentivized the cartels to just go full speed. Right. And they didn't have, they don't have to go deep in the woods anymore. They can do it on private land and hoop houses anywhere. Anywhere. Because whether you have 7,000 plants or 7,000 plants illegally, unregulated, unregistered, it's a misdemeanor. Right. 
And Nobody's it, going to jail for this or getting a ticket at worst. Exactly, Scott. You know, one of the things as a team leader for Met that I did was numerous presentations to legislatures, to governor staff, to NGOs, to conservation groups, um, preservation groups, animal rights groups, everybody, even grower groups. Anybody that would listen. Anybody that would listen. And a lot of people were concerned because we are the weed state of the world, right? We're one of only six true Mediterranean climates on the globe here in California. Mm-hmm. So we like wine in Napa Valley. You're going to grow weed. This we is a great grow. place to grow it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. We grow great cannabis here in this in the Golden State. Um, so we're, and I kind of look at it like, well, if we're going to regulate, great. Do Just regulate properly. You know, do it so that you're not harming the environment. Do it so you're not putting our public, uh, you know, at risk. Put it so you're not undermining a legitimate grow operation that's put hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars into organic product, registered sale, not playing on the black market, trying to do what this law was Sounds reasonable. Sounds reasonable. Right. Well, greed, right. money, special interest, whatever you want to call it, um, kind of put that whole objective, uh, made it a failure and, and kind of kicked it right out the door. So now what I talk about, especially in the second edition is we're five years deep. When I retired, we had been about a year and a half in Prop 64. We were already seeing it fail. But what's happened after five years? And now um, we talk about some documentaries and I just teamed up with Jorge Ventura from The Daily Caller. And we did, I helped him co-host a second documentary he did. Uh, he did two really good ones, one down in Southern California, the Northern Deserts there, Palmdale, mm-hmm. you know, all that area. And just the cartels taking over those massive hoop houses. And they're not hidden. They're in the they're desert. Right in plain sight. Yeah. But all the same carbofuran poisons, the human trafficking going on, other cartel crimes, uh, water stealing at massive amounts, like almost 7 million gallons of water a day just being stolen every day down there for those illegal grows in Riverside, San Bernardino, and LA County a day. If you live in California, you, you, you this this has to be like, well, what? Yeah. Like, that, that much water, especially like living in the barrier and what's happened with our water here our drought, and, our, right? and our water prices and whatnot yeah. to think that somebody's stealing that and getting it for free also equally is maddening. Yeah. It, it's, 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 it's blasphemy. I mean, it's complete. It's so it's such hypocrisy that we're on, you know, drought restrictions yet we're still facilitating and actually incentivizing these groups that steal more water than anything threatening California water. And it's not just California, it's other states that are seeing this too. But when, when we see that kind of shift now, um, yeah, we still have the outdoor, you know, mountainous grows, mm-hmm. but they are definitely decreasing. And now we have the Mexican cartels and now the Asian, the Chinese and the Mongs coming out of the Midwest and like taking over Siskiyou County. And that's where our second documentary I, I'd worked with the Daily Caller guys on. It was all Siskiyou County, which is the Oregon border, Mount Shasta, the most remote county in the, the state. The most remote. Like and you know how pretty it is. Some yeah. of the most gorgeous parts of the state are right there. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. Epic. Yeah. Mount Shasta right there at what, 12, 13,000 feet. And one of the top seven wonders of the world, world they call yeah. Mount Shasta and all that glacier water that is the source. And right below that, in all these communities, we were seeing thousands and actually raiding with Siskiyou County Sheriff's last uh, earlier this year, hitting these cartel grows, grows. in plain sight. And seeing the massive amounts of water that were stolen, where the water trucks were getting the water and the chemicals that were put on the plants inside contained areas, all the same stuff. And I thought I couldn't see anything worse than what would happen in an outdoor grow in the mountains. But imagine being in a hoop house with 3,000 plants in it with some sort of spray, whether it's carbofuran or another massively destructive toxic, because as you're going into these sites and you're looking in like the ready rooms, you know, of these, these hoop mm-hmm. houses, you're seeing Tyvek suits with rebreather masks. So they don't the girls, die. Yeah. They put this on and they spray all this stuff on their plants and they take off. So we had to ventilate and cut those roofs off with the sheriffs, let them aerate a while dissipate, be really careful what we showed, where we were standing on the wind when we showed these plants or did a narration or described what was going on. And I mean, after all I saw operational of 500 plus grows that I was involved in um, for 10, 15 years, I was blown away by the impacts, how much more severe they are on some of these private land tracks because of the concentration of the poisons and knowing they're going right into groundwater and knowing all the water that these guys are stealing from an illegal well that they're drilling or they're, you know, water trucking and stealing Doris city water supplies in the middle of the right. night and piping in Jesus. and then putting the toxics right in the water. So it's just a shift. 
and it hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse mm -hmm. because we just made it easier for them. So they've blown up and now the black market is saturated and, you know, these different marketplaces are, are kind of out of control. So I think the other, as we're talking about the environmental stuff, we keep talking about these pet, these caustic and, and toxic chemicals uh, that are going into our waterways. I don't know that people really understand that you talk about three to five miles downstream. Okay. So a few fish and frogs died, John, is that really that big a deal? Can you talk about the impacts? Because you do a really good job in the book and maybe you could kind of summarize some of the things that you see and what people should understand or what you find people are the most shocked by when you tell them about this stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a good way to put a visual on it, Scott. And I like the way you phrase that. And, and the biggest thing for people to understand is imagine taking two little tablespoons of sugar to put in your morning coffee. And what looks like sugar is carbofuran granules. And you pour that into little Uvis Creek, right? Uh, Croy Canyon, Uvis Creek, Yagas Creek, whatever. Mm -hmm. Coyote Creek. Yep. We'll, we'll take the first grow that you... Right on down into the yeah. into Almaden Valley or through yeah. Almaden Valley and into downtown San Jose. Exactly. And I'll, I'll take Coyote Creek as an example because that's where it started with GI. And mm -hmm. these little teeny tributary led to the bigger creek, which eventually went to the South Bay. And it was a migratory channel for endangered steelhead trout. And for the public that don't know, anybody listening doesn't know what a steelhead trout is. They're basically an ocean-run trout that could go from the ocean, they migrate upstream inland, they lay their eggs and they leave. And 50s and the 60s, they were, you know, prolific, prolific here. They were yeah. everywhere. And now the now they're valued at like 30 plus thousand dollars a fish by the US Fish and Wildlife Service because they're so threatened. So meaning, meaning if you're caught catching one of those or poaching one of those. That's, that's the what, value that they put on the fish because they're so rare. So whether you fish or not, whether you care what steelhead are doing or what red-legged frog that are threatened, nobody wants to see a dead creek. Nobody wants to take their kids or their grandkids or their nieces or nephews or our friends and walk a pristine part of Santa Clara County in one of our great parks on a creek and not see a fish, not see a deer, and know that if you drink that water, you might be drinking a neurotoxin. Mm -hmm. You know, so it has a public safety consumption issue and, and all these creeks and all this runoff we're talking about go right into Santa Clara Valley Water District. They got to go through purification stations and it's our drinking water. It's some of the worst rated drinking water in the state. It is. Yeah. And unbeknownst to people, these grow poisons, whether they're on public or private land, the private land home grows. Contributes to that. They're yeah. all leaching out because they're using those same poisons and they're leaching them right down canyons, which hit tributaries and headwaters. So to put it in perspective, as long as this stuff continues, you have the most deadly, highest concentrated level of poisons that can do the most damage with the least amount of poison for miles. And we just need to be aware of that. And anybody that's a cannabis consumer or not a cannabis consumer that's looking at the cannabis side of things has to realize that this is going on out there. And that's a national issue now. It's not just a California issue because all the states that continue to regulate are finding a way to incentivize the black market because we haven't uniformly done anything nationally. And something's going to have to give. You know, there's that analogy where if you're going to regulate, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make a judgment on it where I sit on the spectrum. I'm just going to say, just do it smart, you know? The wine and tobacco industry have done something nationally. Maybe we ought to look at something like that uh, simply because we got to shut down this environmental impact, especially to water because water is so scarce. And every year the drought gets worse. It, it's not getting any better is what I was just going to say. Yeah. Like uh, we, there ha something has to give. Otherwise, we're just going to continue to pay more money for our water that could be potentially toxic anyway and being taken by somebody else. That's like the environmental, like wildlife wetlands type of type of impact when this stuff is happening like that what are some of the things that happen like in communities uh specific to the bad guys moving in and doing this and having this type of activity so okay i get it john like i'm i'm on board like that sounded bad and 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 i don't want that i live here i drink this water right, right. what else am, what else is happening around me that i might be completely unaware of with regard to the trafficking of this stuff in these chemicals in and these people yep. in yep. and then uh, obviously, conversely, the trafficking of it going out into market. Yeah, I'm going to use a hot recent 2022 end of the year example. And I'm going to talk about Siskiyou County again as an example for what's happening in all these outlying counties. It started in, you know, that first Daily Caller documentary I talked about, mm -hmm. Cartelville, Cartelville, USA, it was called. And it was strictly Palmdale. It was the northern LA deserts. And the Mexican cartels had literally taken over small towns 
that had, you know, the last of the baby boomers living in them, Vietnam veteran era families. And here they are. And the cartels are saying, hey, putting up pictures. We know this is your kid. We know this is your house. And you're going to just turn the other way and let us do what we do. Or people are going to get hurt or worse. Else. Mm-hmm. Same thing happening in Siskiyou County. Those ranchers that have been in there 50 to 100 years don't have water right now to feed their cattle or their sheep. They can't, uh, hay farmers aren't getting enough water on drought restrictions. And the fact that the underground aquifer is being so depleted by these Asian and Mexican cartels stealing the water for illegal cannabis unregulated in Siskiyou, where they can't make a living anymore. People are being threatened at their gates with guys coming up in AK-47s and body armor. No exaggeration. It doesn't happen every day, but certain groups are actually doing that and saying, you're probably going to run out of water. Let it happen and nobody will get hurt. Basically threatening. For that to happen in America, anywhere, Scott, for that to happen in California, anywhere, and especially the last pristine county in California, it's almost like a symbolism as the West and what we epitomize and what we savor and what uh, what we love and what we cherish of Western culture of ranch lifestyle. You know, the last existing cattle families that are left here in Silicon Valley, and a lot of them are my friends, and they're still actively raising cattle. They're running across groves. They're constantly dealing with water. They're some of the best conservationists in the planet. And yet they always got to be on lookout when they're going down in deep canyons or they're going down next to a property in an old ranch house that could be a private land grow. So that's what we've had happen here. And that's how dangerous it has become in these outlying counties. And this is just one state example. And I know it's happening in other states as well. Yeah, I mean, they and they have to go through major cities and major byways in order to get to these places and get back out. This could be somebody you could be driving next to on the freeway, or you never know, you know, shopping next to in the Walmart or in the grocery store or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that stuff comes a lot of other. We've already talked about chemicals. We're talking about you know trafficking drugs, but there's weapons, there's mm-hmm. humans, there's bad intentions, you know, along the way, and they have nothing to lose, uh, th- th- and they don't care, right? I mean, you're you're talking about they don't. And yeah. that, that's what I wanted to get into is the next thing. I mean, you just mentioned people meeting you at your gate with Kevlar vests on and AK-47s. Yeah. Now we move into like, okay, here's all the, for lack of a better term, here's all the shit that they're doing out there. Mm-hmm. For us to combat it, legislation isn't going to be, isn't going to stop it. We've already d- tried to do, or we've already passed some legislation and it's made it worse. So now we have to have boots on the ground and people out there. Can you right. talk about what it's like having to walk into these situations now, given what we know? And how things evolved or have evolved and how you helped evolve uh, the, the enforcement task forces that were there and have been there in order to combat this stuff. Let's talk about it. I mean, because it started out, as you just mentioned, you had an, an AR, a right. sidearm, and yeah. an unarmed civilian with you. What did that get to? Can we talk about that? Absolutely, yeah. And it, it goes into finally after a 13-year you know, kind of development of having our own team at the state level for the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the marijuana enforcement team. And I was, I was the lucky guy that got to co-found and lead it and help pick the guys. And that was a pilot program in 2013. Um, and like we go into in uh, edition one of Hidden War, what the first six years of missions were like. And when we had the leadership support us to say, okay, we get it. We get how dangerous this is. We know it's not a normal patrol thing. We know we need the t- a tactical element. You know, we know you need the gear, you need the canines, you need helicopter support, and you need to not do other jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, it can't need, be a side gig. It can't be a side gig. And, and game wardens all over the nation, we call our, you know, I almost say, uh, I remember an old lieutenant, one of my mentors used to say, you know, we're kind of like Kenny Shoes salesmen. We're jack of all <laughs> trades, man. I'm surprised I'm not pulling a hot dog cart behind the Kenny truck. Shoes, yeah. He goes like, okay, so we got to depredate mountain lions when there are problems. We got to right. do hunting and fishing. Uh, we got to do hunter education, marine patrol, deep cover, commercial wildlife. And now we're going to be like SWAT cops jumping out of helicopters, looking like a military SEAL unit and fight the cartels. What are game wardens not going to do? And our administration was so cool to say, okay, we get this. This is going to deplete patrol and we're always hurting for patrol, but the environmental impacts these guys are doing is so egregious that we're going to make it a priority. And that's all I was trying to get through for 15 years because obviously I had seen every level of environmental crime between Riverside and then coming home. Right. And I had worked every aspect of from standard patrol to deep cover, a commercial to Marine, um, 
internet sales of buy bust. Right. I'd, I'd done it all. And it was really cool to be able to do all that. But I can honestly say, other than some of the biggest environmental pollution, corporate destruction cases of like a creek, I'd never seen something that was just pervasively this damaging all the time. And when I realized, you know, five, 6,000 grows maybe a year back in the heyday when it was all outdoor trespass in the woods before regulation, that, that, hit, that hit a mark. Um, also when we were starting to work with the sheriff's office ad hoc, I'm down here working with Santa Clara, right. Brian codenamed rumble up in Northern California with canine Phoebe, you know, he's running with Shasta, uh, Nate and his guys, the co founder of the team, the captain at the time, my partner, he's in Fresno with, with their guys. You're this, this is a massive territory, by the way. So anybody that doesn't know California, you're talking about four or 500 miles in either yeah, direction, yeah, right? Yeah. Like these are, we're, it's not like you can meet up at the, no, at the, at the HQ today and walk yeah. through some things. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're like, we're spread out and we're locked into our own little mini districts. Uh, and what we're doing at the time is we're helping these other agencies try to catch people, try to eradicate poison plants. Um, we weren't doing a lot of reclamation on the environmental cleanup. That's something we really That's, made a priority. Yeah. We made it tier three of a three prong approach. That was, you know, the third, but probably the most important part on the Met front. Um, but we had our first gunfight in 2005, a stone's throw from where we're sitting in the Los Gatos foothills up on Sierra Azul. And we were assisting the sheriff's office and I had two young wardens helping me. I just promoted a lieutenant of the squad 20 days before this mission, August 5th, 2005, never forget that date. And three sheriff's deputies and it was harvest time and there were pretty aggressive gunmen in there protecting the harvest. Um, and they had fortified positions, they had tactical knowledge, and we were ambushed with one shot, cruising into the grow. Uh, my partner took an AK-47 round through both legs, so he's bleeding out of four holes and still trying to stay in the fight, and we're trying to keep him from bleeding out. And this is before anticoagulant and double tourniquets that we all carry now. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was 05, so... These are some, lessons that learned in blood, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and Scott, you know, the... The military at the time was just getting that down in the war on terror. But and it takes time to trickle down. Yeah. yeah. We accelerated that curve, though, fortunately. Right. Right. Um, and uh, after a really agonizing three-hour wait for an air rescue, um, our guy made it out and survived, thankfully. Yeah. And when Kyle was this close to bleeding out and slipping into shock and his eyes were dilated and he kept falling asleep, I was losing my mind. The most powerless, helpless, most terrifying moment of my career was knowing that he might not survive that ordeal. And what did we just get into? And what is this going to mean for everybody? Mostly him and, you know, his family, if he doesn't make it. But what does it mean for the agency? What does it mean for how game wardens are perceived? And there was a lot of kickback on what are game wardens doing in a drug What's case? What's going on? What's going there? on? These guys like, running around in camouflage. With, yeah, this yeah. is militarized game. What is going on? And and the thing was, we said, this isn't a drug issue, guys. We're not making, you know, it could be cherry tomatoes on the black market for $4,000 a pound on the black market. And we're having gunfights with cartels for that. It's about the money for them. Take the cannabis thing out of it. But regardless... It's the biggest environmental crime we have going out there. Nancy Foley was our chief at the time, and she fought the politics and kept us in the game um, a little more focused. But it would take another decade and, and, and five or six more gunfights where we barely made it out before I finally got the green light with the right leader when Mike Carrion, the chief in 2013, uh, headed up the agency for his last two years. And he kind of mentored me and people around my circle in the academy. He was my mentor and trained us up in the early days. He got it and he didn't really care about politics. He said, this is about the environment and the people of California. So I see where you're going with this. I'll take the internal heat, mm -hmm. go forth and conquer. And we built the team. And it was a struggle to get people to come on board, not so much the operators, right. but perception from other game wardens and other states like, what are they doing in California? Who are, they, are these guys playing soldier? They want to get their ninja on. Or Once again, swatting? California is like the the outlier, right? They're just crazy yeah. over there. There's all this crazy stuff happening in California all the time. Yeah. The reality of it is, is this is reality. It and was necessary. I think it, what, one question I have is, I think I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, why does it take so long? Like why, I know. why does it take to that? And I, I think the answer is because everything has to be based around data. And, you know, how much, you know, what's our return on investment for doing this? And, mm -hmm. you know, if we do this, it immediately equates to that. I can, as a bean counter, I can see that somewhere. Sure. That way I can put it on a legislative bill somewhere. Why does it take so long? Because I, 
it was a decade. There was four, six years, and then another ten years. Yeah. Why, John? It, it was. Yeah. Uh, I ask myself that question every day, and it really boils down to: we are not in bureaucratic agencies. We're not that open to immediate change and moving really quick. Um, Nancy Foley, the previous chief I mentioned, who was a you know great leader, and she was heading it up when we had that first officer-involved shooting. She had a saying that says, uh, "Change is inevitable; growth is optional." And old school game wardens don't want to change. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to do the hunting, fishing, poaching, spotlighting, traditional stuff. And I mean, I had a captain tell me when I was working with the sheriffs all the time, making these great cases, taking really bad people out of circulation. And cleaning up their environmental damage of unprecedented magnitude. Tell me, it's like, you know what, man, I'm, you help the sheriff a little bit, but we're not garbage collectors. You need to be going to water district meetings and checking fishermen. And I just went, whoa. Yeah. You know? and, and, you know, and, and that's just, and it wasn't, you know, I'm not trying to dig on anybody and we won't mention any names, but the bottom line was that was a very traditional guy that'd been there forever and it just didn't fit. It was kind of a sensory overload that now we're a special operations unit working with military assets in America on this issue. I didn't perceive that the environmental destruction level, Scott, would be so egregious from these cartels that you'd have a domestic kind of eco-terrorism thing going on. Mm -hmm. And we would literally attack it as if we had a domestic emergency, rather a wild California wildfire campaign where we're bringing in federal help. And you mentioned what's the solution. And that is honestly the solution for these unregulated grows running rampant in California, especially Northern California, if the governor or the president would say, okay, this is terrorism. Yeah, it's terrorism. And these towns are being taken over by a cartel element from out of the state or out of the country. And our sheriffs, all five of them, you know, are doing, you know, two raids a week and doing the best they can and asking and pleading for help from the governor and from the president. And they're saying, well, you won't regulate in Siskiyou County, so we're not going to send you anybody. That sends a message that I think is so anti-public safety and so anti-environment when we're all about the environment and conserving water right now. Especially here in California. It's such such a contradiction, such hypocrisy, Scott. And so it, this is it. When politics and greed and individual agendas meet up, right? meet up when, when they drive the bus, public safety suffers and the environment suffers. It's that simple. If you take any of that out of it, I, I really think it's, this is common sense. It's black and fricking white. This is happening on American soil, state by state. And it cannot go on. You know, and we talked a little bit about before the show, okay, so this is the cannabis thing. Mm-hmm. But we're hearing about the cartels right now and Tucker on Fox is talking a lot about the fentanyl issue and okay. Gore is talking about fentanyl. And, you know, you're seeing all these figures same groups. It's the same people. Same cartels doing a different crime in their business model, right? So these same, whether it's Sinaloa, whether it's Jalisco New Generation, whatever different cartel is involved and a bunch are still involved on the Mexico side, you've got fentanyl production, meth production, human trafficking, child sex trafficking, gun running, and you've still got tainted cannabis. And fentanyl now, what I think it's it's over a hundred thousand deaths in America. It's massive. It's right climbing now. like crazy. If it's not a if it's not a if it couldn't be if it couldn't basically be titled as a major threat to America's mm-hmm. health and and which to me, health equals security. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know what would be. I mean, the, the numbers are astronomical. We're just They're off the hook. It's off the hook and it's everywhere. There's not, I don't think there's a person in the United States anywhere where right now that doesn't know somebody or know somebody that knows somebody that's suffered from yeah. an overdose or some has been a victim of a crime as a relation as it relates to this. Yeah. It is massive. And and again, your point being, it's the same people that are doing this. Follow the money. Yeah. Right. That's, that's what's going on. Right. They've just shifted and figured out a different, oh, I have a vertical model here. Yeah. I have all the transportation. Yeah. Right. I have the people to, I got to, the labs. I got yeah. the, I got the product. I got the inventory. I got the transpo and I got the pipeline. And, and nobody's stopping me right now. No one's stopping them. Brother. And the demand is way higher than the supply. This is yeah. a great model that I have right now. And the thing that's scary is, and, and we're talking, we're, we're addressing this, um, in the documentary that's in post production that we put together, a call sign trailblazer documentary, but, these fentanyl pills now that are colored like Skittles and they're marketed to go to our kids at parties thinking they're taking, you know, some fun narcotic and every third pill is killing them. Mm-hmm. And it's not just the impoverished communities, you know, or these heroin dens we're thinking about. I've got 
friends of friends and cousins that have a friend in Los Altos High School or up in Atherton. Happen right here in San Jose. It It happens all the time, you know, and these valedictorian level kids are taking one of these pills that someone gives them for a sore knee from a soccer game and they're not waking up in their bedroom that night. The schools don't want to talk about it. The law enforcement doesn't really want to talk about it. They do, but they can't. You know, the officers out there, but there's there's a there's a barrier to getting the the, the word out there. Parents don't want to admit that it's happening, right? Uh, because it's an ugly truth, and it, it, admitting that there's an ugly truth means that you're admitting that there's a problem that we need to address it. But here we are, full circle, yeah, all the way back again to legislation and follow the money, politics, agendas, mm-hmm. what looks good, but doesn't look good. Uh, it is scary. And uh, yeah. this is different than weed, but right? This is a much different, much yeah. different deal. It's a much big, it's a more severe ball game, definitely. And I mean, heroin's still out there, but between the meth, these guys are producing these dirty labs south of the border and internally. Uh, and then the fentanyl. Yeah. It's just massive, massive death numbers. So and, what are, it's, and it's not a slow death. It's much, <laughs> obviously it's instant with these, with these dirty labs. Yeah. If you OD, your chances of coming back from that or not yeah. are pretty low. Uh, and, and there is some, I think we're, there are generating some, in general, there is a little bit more generated, um, I guess, news about it and education about it. So people are a little bit more, I'll say awareness, but it's still wildly out of control. We saw a huge uptick in it here in San Jose, particularly just yeah. right here in my own neighborhood during the lockdowns. Uh, horrible. It was horrible. I yeah. mean, and, and there were, you know, the, the law enforcement was on to some of the the major players in it. They just couldn't, they couldn't keep up with it yeah. uh, at the time. I, But this brings into sort of another thing here, because you're mentioning like, this isn't just happening in California. And that's right. one of the things I want to talk about. Like, this is a, this is a nationwide problem. Some right. of the things we're talking about with the, with the chemically tainted cannabis that might've been more localized at a time, but this drug problem and, and this ravishing of our wildlands, the human trafficking, sex trafficking, drugs, work guns, all this, all these things. If you're not paying attention, if you don't realize that this is a nationwide problem right now, then you're, you're being ignorant. Like you're just, right. you're just choosing not to look at it yeah. in the face. So I wonder what kind of what your take is on all the things that we're, we're, we're that you were seeing happen at our southern border, particularly, and how sure. it relates to this and how the shift that you just mentioned has been influenced by the ease it, for which it is to maybe move things back and forth. Can you talk to that a little bit? I might not be articulating that very well. No, but. I know right where you're going. And yeah, it, it's the southern border threat is just exasperating the problem. And basically with Title 42 ending and this whole issue that's come up this week again and, and for the last couple of months is, you know, Jorge and uh, I mentioned Jorge Ventura, my partner with Daily Caller. He's on the border right now and he's been reporting this stuff left and right and watching these thousands of migrants come across and the cartels are feeding on that. Um, it's not hard to get across the border anymore. In Hidden War, one of the chapters, we talk about a cartel, you know, upper level plaza boss that we caught and debriefed that was busted for a 22 pound methamphetamine cook but was responsible for 50 plus, you know, uh, cartel tainted cannabis grows in Northern California. And this was when we had border protection. This was before the current administration. This is when Trump was trying to, you know, beef up border security, the whole wall debate and that kind of deal. And I asked him, I said, well, we know how good your guys are at growing this. I mean, what if we catch them and deport them? He goes, well, we'll pay for it $7,000 and we'll just get them Send across them right in back. 72 hours or less. And if there are good growers that are part of our, our, you know, our assets, our journeymen, we're going to get them back up here because that's just a roadblock. The border you have, we have tunnels, we have panga boats we can bring in from the Pacific ocean side. You know, we can get across, uh, we know what channels to use. Well, now that's not even an issue. Right. I mean, anybody can cross the border right now. And the other thing is with all this stack of border patrol having to just babysit all of these migrants coming across as Title 42 is about to expire, um, the cartels just hover off and extort those migrants and traffic material with them and get their people across kind of in the fray. So it's it's absolutely exponentially enhanced the problem. You know, to have more and more cartel operatives embedded in America where they were here before with good border protection and what I felt we needed a lot more and previous administration mindset was, yes, we do need a lot more. And we're not attacking immigration. I was just going to say that. Right, Scott, we're not attacking immigration. This is, this is, man, we are a melting pot. We are a country of immigrants. That's what makes America so great. We're talking about 
a group of deportable felons on the international watch list right. that are sociopathic, inhumane, are farming out children, are killing children, are killing adults just for profit. And it's just business. And now we've facilitated that element being embedded within America even, you know, even worse. Uh, and it's overwhelmed law enforcement and we're not getting any help. And that's where nationally we got to look at a massive overhaul. You know, we have to policy, okay, administration, law enforcement assets, education and awareness. Um, it needs to be a national priority, just like the war on terror after we were attacked at 9-11. It's a domestic war on America within borders, period. Yeah, and, you- and, and it's not an exaggeration. We just talked about all the different things these fools are doing. And they are, I mean, I saw an Instagram reel about two months ago and it was a cartel crew like in a blacked out Escalade and they had a 50 caliber machine gun, a big BMG Barrett, and they had a couple of AKs and they're going past the Phoenix police department headquarters and laughing, running their music on the Southern border. They're not just running around on the border. They're just not hiding in plain sight, trying to be low key. They're getting very embrazened under the current mindset of policy. And that is something we have to resort to as individual citizens to watch our own backs. You know, I'm talking a lot about you are your own first responder now. Um, the global pandemic just taught us all what happens if the supply chain goes down, what happens if the power grid goes down, what happens if we're hovering in San Jose, am I going to be, am I here with you or am I going to get to the homeland and get to the woods of Montana where I got a little more room to spread out? You know, there's all those different things that come into play, but I don't think, I think being prepared to survive under any contingency we see in this crazy new world is absolutely important and necessary, but we also need to look at remaining a community group Mm. and keeping our communities strong. And it may not be the big cities and maybe the smaller communities of people we can trust and understand and educate that way uh, because there is safety in numbers. Um, There is diversified skill sets, hunter-gatherer medical supply, you know, supplier, water purifier, whatever the case may be. And we're starting to see that. And no matter what happens administratively or politically, this element is here now and they're embedded and they are going to continue to be a threat. And if we're going to take back our country and reduce the public safety threat and, you know, for the woods being our church and right. our thin green line of water resources and everything, um, I can't think I've been all, I've hunted all over the world. I've been blessed to see some amazing wilderness areas and hiked to the top of glaciers in Alaska for, you know, a, a bucket list hunt. And that's all amazing and it's beautiful, but I, you know, this is home mm-hmm. and there is so much beauty in our home, brother. The Silicon Valley foothills, my memorable places to hunt, fish, hike, Montana mountains, back East. America is so diverse and we have it so good here Mm -hmm. and we're not really paying attention to what's happening on the homeland enough or it's being underrepresented in, in, you know, the current mass media, which is, which is a travesty. So we're going to try to turn it around. It's tough for me to swallow when I'm talking about turning it around. I'd see it being very much ignored in like the major metropolitan areas. And I, I try to be very objective about this. Like mm-hmm. I, I get it. Like you live in the concrete jungle. Right, this, right. this seems like it's so far out there. Yeah. Again, we open this up by five to 10 miles. It's yeah. right here, literally in your backyard. For those people that are listening and kind of and getting the message going, oh shit, I had no idea, man. Like, right. and, and, or I kind of did, but this paints a little bit more of a, a clear picture. What, what is your advice to people that are trying to prepare or be more situationally aware and look out? Like, and I think there's two ways to look at this. One is I do live, I live a couple blocks from here, right? right. But I, I try to get out of nature as often as I can. Right, so I right. think I, I live a dichotomy as, as often as I can. It's important for me to do that. But there, there are a lot of people that live here, like in the in the city, right? And then and there are a lot of people that, that you mentioned Siskiyou County. Sure. And they're out there. What are things in general that people can do to be a little bit more aware and be prepared for things that they might see. And I mean, maybe we start with like, if you see something, say something. Yeah. But how does that start? Because I don't want to say it to the wrong person. And who would I actually go to? Who cares? Who's looking out for this stuff? Yeah. What do you do? Yeah. I mean, and law enforcement has been so taxed right now that, you know, if you're, unless it's a massive, you know, murder intent assault, you might not even see an arrest right. or response. And and this is the thing we saw in, 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 in COVID when it first dropped is there was a point where the 911 system was basically telling people, hey, you may not get a response. If someone's breaking down your door, they're trying to get your supplies, uh, you know, you're being sexually assaulted, they're stealing from your ranch or your house or your apartment in downtown San Jose, whatever, you may not get a response simply because we're so taxed with medical, with civil unrest. Game wardens were taxed. 
Forest Service Rangers were tasked. You guys are picking up the slack on some of that kind we of stuff. We are picking like up the slack everywhere. Allen and, Rock type area, game warden might show up to my house if there's an issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. we were always on, um, we were on lockdowns too, because until this pandemic was understood, federal and state LEOs especially, we weren't interacting with cartel members because they're from all over the world. Right. Who knows what they were pulling out? So, you know, uh, locked gates, poaching, Cartel grows went off the hook the year we had the lockdowns in 2020. The first year it happened, it was like the Wild West again, like 2013 when we started our pilot program. And that's coming straight from my teammates that have now taken over the team, right? And continue doing their good work. Um, but I look at it this way. You got to have a bug out plan if things get terminal in the city. Have somewhere to go and have one plan and have at least one or the other secondary plan. Whether the grid goes down, traffic, how are you going to get out of the city? If you have to leave the city, what type of, you know, what are you taking with you? You know, do you have enough supplies to sustain to wherever you're going to go? If you're going to hunker in place, because not everybody has somewhere to go. Right. I get that. And the city presents certain challenges, but being a San San Jose guy myself growing up here, I get it. If I were to be locked down in San Jose, a generator, Mm -hmm. you know, um, some sort of security barriers for my structure, wherever I'm, you know, hunkering down. And when pandemic dropped, everybody said, I used to say minimum 30 days of supplies or there'd be dehydrated meals, water purification capabilities and potable water, um, three to six months, at least, at least I recommend a year, you know, there's, there's enough with the technology right. of dehydrated foods and how to prepare them and what minimal water do you need? As long as you can get water and you can get food or you can subsistence hunt, you're good to go. And you just have to, you know, you have to be able to do that. Uh, trauma medicine, you have knowledge and supplies. Not everybody knows the advantages of a tourniquet. They're not just for gunshots, right? Or an Israeli bandage. Um, antibiotics, things like this, um, different medications some people need that they rely on for their life. Have extra. Have extra. And if you can't get prescribed extra, um, you know, Recoil and Caribou, Gun Digest are all one entity, right? So Recoil Magazine is kind of part of my group. And um, they did a really cool, uh, for Recoil Off Grid, uh, I write articles for that great publication. And it's never been more proximate now and necessary than Mm -hmm. survival preparedness. It's not just for the fanatics, right? Um, They did a really- I have a tough time getting people's heads around that sometimes. Isn't it crazy? It's like, they're like, oh, what are you just- You're a weirdo. You're a weirdo. Uh, It's like, well, no, I'm not. I was here two years ago. Yeah. I'm here now. Yeah. yeah. We we had a test. It was a shot across the bow. It wasn't anthrax. It killed 80% of everybody. But see, look how we reacted. It was insane. And the, it wasn't the, even that terminal. The reaction was very unreal. It was crazy. It was nuts. The reaction was more fearful than the unknowns of the virus. Could not agree with you more. Yeah. And that's the human condition freaking out in panic and not thinking through. But hopefully we all learn from that. I want to play to the positives. Right. Exactly. Um, but the thing is like, uh, you know, for prescription drugs or somebody that's insulin dependent, say as a diabetic or there's other heart medications somebody needs doctors, there was actual articles in Off Grid about, well, what you can do is you can renew your prescription and you can save some of those overlap prescriptions to get you at least a month, two months, three months of a supply. They're going to last at least two years before they expire and have those ready to travel. Right. Because maybe the grid goes down and you don't get a prescription filled for a year, you know, or at least a couple of months um, in a worst case situation. And my whole thing is prepare for the worst and hope for the, the best. best yeah. And I find every time, and I'm sure you know this too, running your great business here, when you're prepared and you have the supplies you need, you never really get into catastrophe. But that one time I forgot to bring this tool. Oh yeah. I'm on a hunt right. or I'm like, oh man, did I pack that right? Oh no, I did not bring the rain gear. It ruins your trip. Right. It does. Yeah. It just basically, you, it, 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 there's a part, there's a fail, you know, there's a, a partial fail there. So I don't think you can think about it too much. I mean, I, I mean, maybe you can, but it really is about in the sense of being you know, prepared. So yeah. I'm not, it's not doomsday. I'm not walking around all day long, fearful of, right. going, I don't have to be because I'm feel prepared. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, you know, I, I get to go to bed at night and not, not have to think about it. And going back to like your food supply and things for like six months to a year. What? I mean, you don't have to have, again, going back to the technology and how this stuff is put together now, mm-hmm. you don't have to have another facility to store all this stuff. In. It's very compact. It's very yeah. realistic. If you, if you take a few minutes, even just a few minutes to kind of research this stuff, it's really not that, that out of the, out. it's not, it's not that far out there. You can get right. this stuff done. So. Yeah. Um, I just, you know, we were kind of talking about, uh, 
the, you know, some of the, the things that you're doing, you, you mentioned the new edition of the book, The Hidden War. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You've, you've you talked about writing for Recoil and you talked about, uh, you know, the documentaries you're doing. Catch us up, man, because I, I have to, I have to be honest. Like when I see your post come up, man, seems like you're living your best life right now. <laughs> yeah. We're hunting, we're rolling around in nature, we're out in yeah. the woods, like you're staying fit. And that's something we didn't really even talk about, you know, with this, we did talk about the, the, you know, the remoteness and you mentioned dr- dropping mm-hmm. way down into this Canyon and then, uh, you know, and then having to come back out, hustle out of there undetected. And, and the, you know, the one thing I don't think we really expanded on, which the, you, you do a great job in the book and talking about is the reclamation of this land at the end of these busts, like right. part of your job. And one of the major parts of your job was basically cleaning up the mess that had been left behind. That's human trash. That's toxic waste. That's, uh, the, the equipment, like the pumps, yeah. the vis queen, the pipes, the, all the stuff that they would leave yep. behind, not to mention the plants. And some of this stuff not being, you can't necessarily airlift it all out. You have to right. hike it out and all that stuff. So I, I didn't want that to go left on set, but you're staying fit. You're out there, you're doing your stuff, man. Talk to us about what's going on now and what we can continue to look forward to. Yeah, I'll get into that. But you, you just, I'm glad you joggled the fitness th- side. I was kind of like, we were in the other yep. topics and, and, you know, I'm sitting at red dot gymnasium <laughs> right now with a bunch of fit, your physically fit specimen yourself running a tier one gym here in San Jose. Thanks, it's man. a great, great facility, but yeah, I'm t- I talk about this in the documentary and I, I talk about it in my post. And, you know, I mean, uh, I'm not in Ironman triathlon shape anymore today. Like I did two long course triathlons in 07 and 09, and that was the peak goal. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like I was in the best shape of my life then, but I want to maintain some level. And you know what it's like being a business owner and trying to work out at the same time? It's constant juggling act. You constant juggling act. But physical fitness now with what we saw through the pandemic is it can't really be a luxury, I don't think. Because one thing is, if the grid goes down and you're cold, if the grid goes down and you're eating less food, if the grid goes down and now you're doing more physical exertion because you have to find supplies, you have to move around, you have to care for people. You said the same thing of what we had to do at the job, you know, and what you have to do at your job. You know, it's just, it's essential now, you know. And one thing we learned in COVID is the amount of depression Mm -hmm. from lockdowns, suicides, Mm -hmm. drug abuse alcohol abuse until people got outside finally and got fresh air, vitamin D sunlight and got a little bit of inner strength and a little bit of hope, right. And optimism. And that all goes down to your mental fitness and your physical fitness. And the only positive that came out of that whole shit show of lockdowns in the pandemic brother was we saw a 30 to 40% increase in the number of hunter safety certification online classes nationwide, people becoming hunters that were anti hunters, people buying guns and getting training (laughs) that were totally anti gun and going, Oh, now I get it. Oh, wait, what? I can't walk away with this. I might get, I might, you know, I might get overwhelmed tonight, man. We're getting locked down. Oh, there's a waiting period. I voted for that. You know? So we had all this awareness through catastrophe. And we had some unity because of that. Um, and I think I, that scared some people, man. It, it freaked them out. I think that scared some people just in yeah. terms of the unity that got created and all the stats that you just put out there, because we're yeah. starting to see this huge groundswell of potential legislation that's going back mm-hmm. to fight a lot of these things as it, it is. pertains to firearms ownership. And, and I'm hoping, like I'm hoping regardless where we sit left or right, we all unify enough to know, hey, there's certain inalienable rights that equate to survival in the long run. That's what our forefathers wanted. And we have been a conservation model from the get-go. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that I can't do what I enjoy the most if I don't maintain a basic level of fitness. And I personally, and I'll be completely honest, if I go a day or two or three without a long swim, a long hike, a run, some, some weight training, some CrossFit dynamics or whatever, I'll start to get pretty dark. Mm-hmm. I'll get a little negative. A little cranky. A little cranky, a little, uh, little uh, bitter, you know? I, I know My friends feeling. and family know how that goes. <laughs> so yeah, it, it does help. And I think we're right right now really blessed to be able to do exactly what I love to do. And it's really educating and promoting the thin green line right. for the sake of everybody. And, and one thing I like to do more than anything else, I mean, I certainly have my, you know, I lean a certain way politically, I guess somebody would say, but I think I'm pretty middle of the road based on the situation, pretty open-minded issue by issue. But the bottom line is there's a certain, certain humanistic have to have some convictions, man. There's a certain humanistic thing we need to do as human beings to each other and, co- and with each other for community. And I want to unify as much as I possibly can with the time I have on this planet because God knows we are, di- we're divided. 
we're polarized in so many ways. And I never saw more fear and more hate than through the lockdowns and the pandemic and the powder keg and the capital issue and the statues coming down. And so sad. It is, but I'm, but I'm seeing a lot of encouragement. You know, I'm seeing people having those conversations now. And I, I think we all got a little humbled through this, uh, this, this change and I hope it continues and we'll keep on it. I agree with you, man. I think it is. There's some of that coming out of the other end now. It took a long time. It did. I mean, we <laughs> talked talk, talk about it taking decades for yeah. you to, to make change, you know, yeah. with policy and getting the support that you needed. Mm-hmm. It just, and it, and it was about some individuals, yourself, you know, uh, you mentioned some of the people at the, at the higher level that were pushing buttons and not taking no for an answer and, you know, kind of pushing things through. And it really does show the power of the individual. I love how you tied in the physical fitness piece, man. If you're not physically fit and things get tough, mental, your mental fitness is closely behind. You will start to break down as we've already, yeah. already talked about. So as we're trying to become a more fit, you know, and more aware type of human right now to all the things that are going on. Um, Look, you've got the books. Talk books yeah, sure. let's talk the books because I, I, just my my own personal kind of take on on the book. First off, I found it very surreal. I had a personal connection to it because again, this is like my backyard. It's in your backyard. Oh, it was yeah. so fun to listen yeah. to. I remember actually there was a portion of the book I was actually listening to on the road because we were drive to this firearms event. We were in Southern California, literally driving down the 101, and there was a portion of the book where I could look. I could look west and see exactly was. where you yeah, were at that point. And yeah. I remember just having this huge smile on my face and telling CC riding shotgun in the first. Oh my God, this shit happened right here. <laughs> this is this is nuts. <laughs> so there, there's a personal connection to it. But what I didn't expect, first off, the the book is chock full of of incidents, you know, and, yeah. and stories that you told, and you you shared one of those earlier with the first gunfight that you mm-hmm. that you got into. And I think it's eye opening to think that again, you mentioned bad guys are out there and they're they're, they're out there for a reason and yeah. they, and they, they have, they have weapons platforms that maybe didn't, that you're at the time when you first started, your weapons platforms didn't stack up to. So there was, an, right. there yeah. was an evolution of that and how you helped evolve those things and the, the, the type of equipment you were using. You mentioned the force multipliers, uh, when you guys read the book, you got to read the book, learn about Phoebe. Phoebe's one of my favorite characters. She, in the whole bunch. Oh, she was awesome. She pulls your heart right apart. Yeah, t- totally. Yeah. Um, just the things that, that were done in the small unit fashion and the impact that you guys were able to make. I talked about the, the environmental impacts that I learned about. I had no idea to the yeah. extent uh, of this, but you, you, you take it a few steps further and you talk about, you know, the, some of the data and stats that were collected along this time that I think was with all the time that it took, you guys were handling this in a very smart and practical way, we were knowing. finally starting to document, which was lacking in the past for sure. So yeah. some of the stats that came out of it and some of the things was like, holy, sh- I mean, why are we not taking those now and putting those mm-hmm. out in front as a model for, if that's what it was then, you know, how is it now? And why, why isn't the public hearing more about this, you know, through their legislators and through their representatives to understand how they can contribute to helping make change? So those are some of my major takeaways, but you got the new edition coming yeah. out. So what's new in the new edition that people need to know about? Yeah, this is, uh, you got the first uh, advanced copy, bro. So honored. This is, yeah. So just, honored. These uh, handful just landed last week and we're going to, so the second edition of Hidden War, um, is going to drop January, the week of January 16th, okay. where everybody can order it and get personalized copies and get on Amazon. There'll be an ebook on it. I'm probably going to read the new material so we can do another Audible. But essentially where it changes is all those chapters are still there and they kind of have to still be there because that's the core of what the problem is. But um, Jack Carr, good friend and fellow conservationist and I mean, he could have been a game warden instead of a tier one seal. It could have, you know, inter- interchange him. He's an interesting guy, man. Yeah. Like a, everything he guys puts out is yeah, awesome. He, he's amazing. And, and he was very generous to write. Absolutely. A, one of the most beautiful forewords I've ever, I mean, just floored me when, when he sent it over. So he wrote the forward, another great friend, a seal team guy. That's a canine guy, Mike yep. Ritland and a conservationist. Right. He's an outdoor guy too. Yep. Mike wrote the afterward note. And what I did is I rewrote an introduction, a very lengthy one that's, tons of information. What has changed since the first book was published right after I retired? It came out early 2019, right before the pandemic dropped in lockdowns in 2020. So what did these transnational criminal organizations, i.e. the cartels, what did they do? What has changed 
in these last three or four years. And we go into a lot of stuff we talked about today. Um, obviously, the border issue, what I saw on the southern border, filming our first pilot film of the Thin Green Line that was mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. We capture all of that. I talk about the trends. I talk about what we just did in Siskiyou County and just basically make Hidden War a very updated version of what the Hidden War is doing and why the Hidden War continues and why it's gotten more severe and it's diversified into fentanyl and all these other things we talked about today and why it's a national priority and we got to attack it as such. And now one thing is when the first book came out, uh, you know, I hadn't connected with Joe Rogan. I hadn't connected with Jack Carr or Mike Ritland or Meat Eater or any of those guys. And they were blown away. Like what? Same. Wait a minute, man. I fought the global war on terror, like for a whole career in the SEAL teams. And this is going on in America. Backyard. I'm on this. I want to jump in the fight right now. And they made the thin green line go outside of game wardens and go outside of park rangers, you know, or border agents or military. They really made it about the environment um, and how that is affected in a positive way um, this fight. And that's what the new book's going to go into. And it's, uh, you know, got all the color in it. They did a real good job and it's a little lighter to carry around because it's a trade paperback. We're down to about maybe 50 of these of the hardbacks list, <laughs> of yeah. the hardcovers. I brought a couple for you guys today, but yeah, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're gone. So it's exciting. And, I can't uh, wait to get into it, man, because that was the first, co- that was as soon as I finished that book and I closed it up, I was like, well, what happened? Right. Yeah. Because again, yep. like you said, it came out in 19 and there's been so many other things that have happened. Yeah. Where are we I, at now? Right. Where are we at? And mm-hmm. so part of this and you kind of you know, talking about the book is also this continual education path that you're on and the people that you're meeting with on a regular basis. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Because you're still getting in front of people trying to spread the message of what's going on out there at the state level, at the national level. Can you talk a little bit about your activity there? Yeah. One of the things that really changed uh, when I retired in a good way is I spoke, I mean, obviously I was California based um, as a lieutenant for the marijuana enforcement team and a game warden here. So I spoke and educated as much as I could all over California and with the blessing of administration, because outreach was a very critical part of what the team leader format had to do. And I've been doing outreach reach since the first book 11 years ago, since, you know, Wild Justice on National right. Geographic Channel was our game warden reality show that we did three Great seasons show. on. Yeah. And thanks. Yeah. And, you know, that was one of those things where that was an opportunity for a very resource limited, mm. small agency to put the thin green line word out of what game wardens do in California and the diversity of it. Right. And even though we weren't a full Met team yet, our own that was all 2008, 2009. That was the heyday of us working with the sheriff's office. So viewers worldwide were seeing tactical game wardens and sheriffs jumping out of helicopters, going on canine assaults, doing chasing down bad guys. Land, sea, air stuff. Yeah. They, they, they saw all of that and they went, what? And special forces veterans coming back from fighting the global war on terror, like, I didn't know game wardens did that. I didn't know that was a problem in the U.S. I can go fight domestic terrorism and protect the environment because I grew up hunting and fishing. Right. And I'm highly trained. I want to yeah. sign up. So yeah. the recruitment of a show like that, and that's why outreach is so important for the thin green line. We don't have these massive PR budgets. You know, we're not, we don't get reality TV show opportunities all the time. Um, Rick Stewart with American Zella Productions and Patriot Profiles. Patriot the, Profiles. the two documentaries he did that are right. on my YouTube channel, they're free to watch. Just go to subscribe to the John Norris YouTube channel and go enjoy them. Some of the best documentaries ever built. And Rick with his military uh, experience and his connection to special forces and to tell the first domestic story of these cartels when he got wind of the first book through Wayne LaPierre, who mm-hmm. read it as the head of NRA and said, Rick, you better read this. I think we got to do more with this. And that was all because of the outreach component or those stories don't go further than our little fiefdom of California. And so now, um, since the first book dropped and coming into, you know, the, the second edition of Hidden War, speaking across the country, you know, and it's everything from uh, national game warden conventions to narcotic officers association groups to consulting for tactical units on the border that are integrating canine apprehension issues right. and dealing with the poisons. Um, rural water boards speaking at their annual conferences and getting wind of this because they heard me on a podcast or they read the book. They would have never have got it from agency channels. So um, 
outreach is super important. And I get the question all the time, do you miss the fight? Do you miss the team? Do you miss the guys? And that is so rhetorical because I'll tear up thinking about it. Of course. I miss them all the time, brother, yeah. you know, yeah. and I miss getting in the stuff with them and pushing with a gun. Right. But, you know, they do say the pen is mightier than the sword in so many ways. And when I gave up my carbine and all the kit and I'm writing and I'm talking and everything and they're just going, go forth and conquer. We can't say a word. We don't get that anymore, but thanks for telling our story and more importantly, showing that it's not just a California issue. Because at right. the end of the day, I love California, but we're Americans. You and me, everyone in this studio right now that's hanging out with us, we're just proud to be Americans. So we need to look at this as an American issue. This is a domestic issue that whatever happens in California is going to have a ripple effect with the cartels in Oklahoma and the Eastern Seaboard and vice versa. And one thing I, I can say is, um, being part of Warden's Watch now and co-hosting that podcast and the Thin Green Line podcast is seeing perceptions from other game warden agencies and what they're facing, right? You know, and people that aren't game wardens but have knowledge, um, you know, through our Thin Green Line platform that deals with that issue. But you don't have to be a game warden; it's not just a game warden story. So all those things help, and we have a we have a long way to go. So. Uh, super privileged to talk. Anyone wants to listen, I'll speak um, and not try to bore you to death with uh, this crazy stuff. But at the end of the day, I just got to keep doing what I'm doing um, and, and give back as much as we can. We got a lot to fix. So we, we, we started with conservationism and you were just talking about all the different types of groups that you're talking, talking about and particularly as an American people. Like this is our land. This is what we have. Right. Right. And, and it is ours and it is our job. We are supposed to be stewards of that. And then you've been that the whole time and mm -hmm. it's taking you on kind of this wild path. Right. Uh, and you know, again, wild, <laughs> wild is relative. I mean, one of the questions I might have is like, man, there's so much in here. When you, when people read the book, they'll get this question. I think more of it. Like when's the movie? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and I'm so, I'm half joking, but I'm watching your eyes there. I'm like, oh shit, maybe there is a movie coming out. Like, well, what I can say on that is something's in development. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Something's in development yeah. and it's, uh, and it, yeah, it's on a, the scripted feature film, uh, deal with some really, really good people. Oh, that is awesome. Yeah. I was half joking about that. Yeah. Wait, and I haven't talked about that publicly, but we're into, uh, yeah, it's, it's coming together nicely. And the nice thing is to kind of compliment that there's another group of military veteran conservation producers that I have allied with to tell the call sign trailblazer documentary. That's going to tell a little bit deeper into the personal background, but really go into the national trends of what we're dealing with. Um, tell the hidden more story, and there's quite a few surprises in that as some of the people we interviewed, some mind blowing guests. Um, yeah, brother, I cannot wait. I yeah. I'm, I'm excited to share more when I can on it, but definitely you're going to be one of the first to know, oh, man. And we can, if you want, we'll come back on and talk about it. Oh, and, hell and we'll, yeah. And we'll do it right here at Ground Zero. Uh, hell yes. This is the home team yeah. now. Hell I mean, come yes. Come on, look where we're at. Yes. I cannot wait. I mean, so you're on Instagram. You can just talk about where people find you. You mentioned the YouTube channel. Get onto the John Norris uh, uh, YouTube channel. Make sure, sure you subscribe there. Is is uh, is Instagram the best place to go? To, it, it's you know? see, yeah, you know, you know how it is with IG it's now. Tough, Everybody's yeah. on social social media first. So on Instagram, it's just John Norris, J-O-H-N-N-O-R-E-S. You can't miss you, the icons right there. Um, Facebook, same thing. John Norris uh, website, www.johnnorris.com, where you can get to my email. You can order a blade, one of my signature blades, the whole V-Knives blade line that we've, we've talked a little bit about. Uh, any of the books, uh, especially the new one, because the old one won't be available here in a few days and things like that. And then just ask questions. I get so many people asking questions about, hey, I saw you here. I heard this here. I'm really interested in being a game warden. I didn't know how critical that job was. I thought I was just going to check hunting and fishing licenses. And now I see it's gotten so much deeper. And, you know, I'd, I'd like to eventually work onto a med team if a state has that. But, you know, where do I go? Mm -hmm. And we're getting a lot of interest, man, from just hundreds, if not thousands of young adults and, and people in a second or third career. So that's a real benefit. And I answer all those questions, maybe not right away if I'm swamped, but you're always going to get an answer back through email or whatever. So just reach out to me there. You mentioned the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, John Norris YouTube channel, can't miss it. And there's about 52 videos and every, I don't, mon I mean, I don't charge for any of the documentaries right. that I produce. I make sure everybody can get free viewing 
That's all on YouTube, all the teasers of everything that's developed and links to all the other podcasts. We'll have you the link to this podcast up there, everything from Joe Rogan, Jack Carr, Mike Ritlin, Meat Eater, and any of the others we do. And I can encourage people if they want to listen to more Thin Green Line related stories, hear Game Warden stories that are always different and compelling. Yes. And some really cool guests on our Thin Green Line podcast. Just go to wardenswatchpodcast.com and all of our content that I co-host with Lieutenant Wayne Saunders in New Hampshire is there. I think that's it. Man, it's so it's <laughs> it's so diverse, but it's also so dynamic. Like even if you just jump on the YouTube channel, you get to you get a little taste of all the different things. And yeah. it is vast. I mean, there's so many things there from again, like maybe busting poachers just locally, right off one of our local roads here in San Jose, yeah. to being deep in the bush with your with your team, with the canines, with the helicopters, yeah. with the boats. I mean, there's just there's so much to to kind of to kind of gather and 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 take in there. Um just a one quick shout out before we we promised we would do this before we before we hung up today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we, we got to give a shout out to our boy Pernay. Yeah, uh, Pernay hooked us up, yeah. and he was supposed to be here because I was supposed to do this last week, but we were filming in SoCal, yeah. so you were gracious enough to bump me to here. And I know he's in Oregon, but thanks, brother, for bringing Scott and I together. And we're gonna we're gonna all uh, collide and crash paths and celebrate. But I'm I'm really glad he uh, he made this introduction, man. It's been a been an honor to be here. Yeah, that's how these things happen, man. Yeah. and uh, I can't wait to. Uh, to see the things that you're doing. I'm going to get into that book like right away. That thing's getting open tonight for sure. No, no shit. <laughs> uh, I, I have to kind of catch up, especially after today's conversation. I know you're a very busy person. Uh, yes, we had to reschedule. I was happy to do it. Uh, it Thank worked you. out great. And, uh, and if there's ever an opportunity for us to sit down and, and, and talk again, as, as things continue to develop for you and for the efforts that you're making and those other people behind the thin green line, uh, I would lo- I'd love to be able to be here to spread the message. So um, God bless you, man. Thanks for all that you've done. And thanks for being here again today. Hey, man, Scott, I appreciate you. And we will definitely come back. Great being here. Cheers, brother.